started. Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner, I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm so excited for class today because we get to go all over that Constitution and look at voting rights, a topic that's in the news a lot, on people's agenda a lot, and just, you know, last week was in everybody's community because we're, there was a lot of people voting in local elections. So today's conversation, we are here with one of our top scholars at the Constitution Center, Tom Donnelly, my partner in crime for our classes. Tom, how excited are you to talk about voting rights? 10 out of 10, I'm very excited. <laughs> awesome, okay. So let's dive into this deep. Now students, as we go through, at any point in time you want us to pause or you wanna ask a question, put it in the chat. I'll search in there for any questions and ask Tom all that you can put in there. But also as we go through, a lot of you have other stories and other ideas that you want to share. Use it as a community of sharing content around voting rights. Very fun and a really good way to learn, not just from us, but from each other. So I love this quote, Tom, from Harry Truman. Um, and it kind of sums up the way we think very much today about voting. And so a vote is the best way of getting the kind of country and the kind of world that you want. And that's how a lot of people think about voting. But today we're gonna to dive deep into voting and where is it in the constitution and why is it in the different sections that it is? And also one other thing, and here's kind of the list of questions that I always have for you, Tom. One other thing around voting is can you try to help us understand the way the right to vote is written in the constitution and how it's prefaced. And there's a lot of amendments around voting and a lot of those amendments talk about not being denied, not being denied based on A, B, or C. So can you kind of help as we go through all this, spell out why they wrote it those ways, and then how we, over the big scope of our country's history, see voting as a part of our country and a part of who we are, just like Truman would say, a part of getting what the kind of country that we want. So wanna dive into the big idea or dive into where is it in the constitution? Let's start with the Constitution and we'll get to the big idea. Sound good? I love that. Yeah. So this is my favorite world. Where's Waldo visual of this year's glasses? Um, Jenna, our designer, is amazing. And she also listed for you where it is in the Constitution. So there's a lot for you to go through. So go nuts, Tom. Absolutely. So yeah, let, let's begin with the original Constitution, the one that was framed in Philadelphia in 1787, right near the National Constitution Center site. Um, so there are really four big parts of the Constitution that we want to talk about in the original Constitution dealing with voting and elections. Article 1, Section 2 gives us the, uh, the requirements for voter qualifications in elections for the United States House of Representatives. So it covers that first body of Congress. Of course, the Constitution separating Congress, the legislative branch, into a U.S. House and a U.S. Senate. So Article 1 is giving us the voter qualifications for the U.S. House. But then Article 1, Section 3 is giving us the, uh, the rules for the elections of United States senators. So under the original Constitution, United States senators are selected by state legislatures. We would later revise that with the 17th Amendment providing for the direct election of senators. So that's Article 1 gives us qualifications for the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Article 1, Section 4, we don't talk about it a lot, but it's actually a really important part of the Constitution. It, it leaves the time, place, and manner of elections to the state legislatures, but subject to regulation by Congress on the back end. So it's making the states really the primary actors here in setting the time, place, and manner of elections. And a lot of the key rules that we're addressing in the context of elections, but leaving a role for Congress to also regulate them on the back end. And so finally, the last provision you see there is Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, which sets up the Electoral College. This is the process we use to select presidents. Curry, if we're taking all of those provisions together, what's the big idea, what's the big takeaway? It's that the original constitution leaves the issue of voting largely to the states. So it's a story of federalism. It's a story of state power. It's not to say Congress has no role to play, but the states are playing the primary role in shaping voting and elections. I'll pause there, Curry. I that is so helpful and Every single time that we talk about, you know, voting in states or voting, like we live in Pennsylvania, so like voting in Pennsylvania, everybody has a little bit of a trouble trying to figure out what's different and what's the same. And this, especially section four, explains that because it's left up to the state to say exactly what time, what place, and what manner. 
So certain rules in different counties can be different from county to county within a state and from state to state. Um, so that really helps explain why you can't put your finger on one re way we vote in our country, because it's left up to the states. Now, Tom, that will come with the inevitable, but why did they do that that way? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a general feature of the Constitution as a whole. I mean, the big theory there is that we do need a national government to do some big things that require us to act as one. And so we did want a new government that was stronger than the one that came before it under the Articles of Confederation. But at the same time, for the founding generation, they looked at state and local governments as the parts of the government that are closest to the people. So the national government, it was going to be maybe far away, maybe distant, maybe elitist in certain ways. But in order to really have government by we, the people, the founding generation wanted to ensure that certain decisions could be made by those state and local governments closest to the people themselves. Uh, and that's a perfect segue into all of these amendments. When I think of we, the people, I think of Article 5 of the Constitution and the ability to amend or just mend the Constitution. And that's a lot of amendments that have to do with voting. And so what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight amendments that give more information to the Constitution on how voting should happen. So tick us through these big, big ones and what impact that they made on voting in America. Yeah, absolutely. So the original Constitution is leaving a lot of the questions that we care about on a day to day basis, like how to register to vote, whether you could vote by mail, whether you could drop off your ballot, things like that primarily being left to the states. But over time, we use the Article 5 amendment process, the process that allows us to change the Constitution to write new protections and new rules for voting and elections over time. So let's take through these and then we can talk about what's the big takeaway. We don't want to get bogged down in the details. We want the big takeaway. But let's do the details first, at least a little bit of them. So here, the 12th <laughs> Amendment, so this is right after the Constitutional Convention, right after the Bill of Rights. The 12th Amendment is al already alters the Electoral College in certain ways. So we're already tinkering with how we're going to select presidents in the United States. Then we flash forward ahead to the amendments that are ratified after the Civil War. Here specifically the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment Section 2 provides a mechanism for penalizing states when they don't deny African-American men access to the ballot box. But also over time, the Supreme Court eventually uses the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to protect voting in a series of 20th century cases. So the 14th Amendment you know, plays certainly a role in voting in elections at the Supreme Court today. And then the 15th Amendment's a really important amendment that bans racial discrimination in voting. And so with the 14th and 15th Amendment, many scholars refer to this as America's second founding. And part of that second founding was trying to extend full and equal political rights to African Americans. So that's 12, 14, 15. The 17th Amendment, we already previewed it a little bit, but it provides for the popular election of U.S. senators. It means we, the voters, get to pick who our senators are, not the state legislatures, which the original Constitution said. The 19th Amendment bans sex discrimination in voting. This is where we're providing new voting rights protections to women. The 23rd Amendment grants the District of Columbia three electoral votes in the Electoral College. So it's giving Washington, D.C. voters a voice in presidential elections. This arose out of the Civil Rights Movement. Part of this was because Washington, D.C. has a large African-American community, and so it was a way of bringing those voters into the presidential election process. The 24th Amendment bans poll taxes in national elections. This is going right at the heart of Jim Crow discrimination in the South, the 24th Amendment, getting rid of one of those rules that the Southern states use to keep African Americans from the polls. And finally, the 26th Amendment protects voting rights for those 18 and older. Before that, most states limited voting to those 21 and older. But the 26th Amendment arose out of the experience of the Vietnam War, where we're sending a lot of young people under the age of 21 to go sacrifice their lives and fight for their country. And we said, you know, if, if, if you're old enough to go and fight for our country, you should be old enough to vote at home. And it's so cool because this is an amendment, Curry. It was the fastest one ever ratified. It was ratified in under four months, which is extraordinary. Wow. Yeah, that is mind blowing because everybody talks today about how hard it is to amend the constitution. If you have the right alignment and the right energy, four months, people, four months, that's speedy. And so just a couple questions to kind of clarify. So the 24th Amendment banned poll taxes in national elections. Are they quickly banned in state elections after that? They are. They're banned two years later in a case called Harper, where the Supreme Court then says, oh, no, no, we're not going to have poll taxes in state elections either. 
Cool. Okay. Got it. Thanks. I wanted to make sure everybody got that extra piece that goes through. Um, and I think it's fascinating to think about DC and the reasoning behind the 23rd amendment and how it was expanding the voting rights. Now, as we look at these amendments and we go through, you know, I see it over and over again. It bans racial discrimination. It bans gender discrimination, bans poll taxes. So it's banning, it's saying, no, you can't do that to things that are blocking people from having the right to vote. But there's nothing that says you have the right to vote in here in the constitution. So how do we understand that type of writing of these amendments or the type of writing and how do we understand the right to vote? Is it, is, some people say it's a fundamental right to vote. Is, is it considered a fundamental? Like, how do we understand it with the way the language has been written in the constitution? The Supreme Court beginning in the 20th century says it's a fundamental right. Many Americans and many movements have argued that it's a fundamental right over time. We're looking at how do we understand what the amendments do and how we should think about the right to vote as enshrined in the Constitution. I think it's important to think of the amendments in relationship with the original Constitution. So again, the original Constitution is leaving many of these decisions to the states, and the states can decide yes or no to whether or not to extend voting rights to particular groups. And then these amendments over time are providing new protections to new groups. And this is a way to think about it is if, if, the, if the main principle of the American Constitution is popular sovereignty ruled by we the people, these amendments are a way of drawing more and more groups into the we the people that get full citizenship, that have full political rights. And so over time, the 15th Amendment banning racial discrimination, 19th Amendment banning sex discrimination, the 26th Amendment banning age discrimination, all that this is doing is it's taking away various excuses that states can use to restrict voting rights. And over time, it's creating an important rebalancing of the system. The states still play a hugely important role, but each of these amendments empower the national government to step in and protect the voting rights of these various groups. And so it's a way of giving the national government more power than it had before, not unlimited power, but more power than it had before to protect these particular groups that we've written into the Constitution. That is really helpful. Thank you so much, because sometimes that becomes like a debate and a discussion and trying to understand why it's written that way and continuing with the balance of federalism, but with the role that the national government is to do is to protect citizens. And so when we think about citizens and having the the right, the political right to vote as a citizen, that's probably going to lead you nicely to the 14th Amendment, Tom. So would you like to take a turn on the 14th Amendment or dive into how this time period started to expand and where did the genesis kind of start with voting rights being expanded to more and more? I'd like to sort of do it chronologically, Curry. So I think we could capture the power of the 14th and the 15th Amendment better that way, is my guess. Great. So let's start with the founding generation in 1776. So yeah, rewinding to 1776, you know, after America declares independence, one of the cool things that happens is that the states have to write their own constitutions. So they get to decide their new form of government in state by a state by state basis. And as they do this, they set up new voting rules. And so they have great, the states have great power over elections, over who's going to be able to vote. And if you're looking at that period and you're looking for a general rule, of course, there's variety across the states. But the general rule is that most of these states establish property requirements for voters. So they're limiting voting rights to those who own property. This generally means white male landowners. I mean, that's really what they're, they're, they're doing here at the founding generation. But it's not to say that's the only people that can vote at the founding. So we already see in the early years, some states, some of the more radical states moving away from property requirements altogether. So we see this with Pennsylvania and Vermont really, really early on. But we also see what's cool about Vermont is Vermont has also banned the institution of slavery. And so within Vermont, all the way at the founding, it gives all free men, including African-Americans, the right to vote. So you have, even at the founding, you see free African-Americans able to vote in certain states, not most of the states, not even close. <laughs> Just, you know, it's not as though this is a widespread practice, but it's more than zero. And I think that's a really notable thing to remember. The other is that my home state of New Jersey also allowed unmarried women landowners to vote from 1776 until unfortunately only 1807. That's when the state legislature said, no, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna do what other states have done and limit this to free white male citizens. But we see already at this early phase, both a majority rule that's providing property, uh, uh, property requirements of voting, but some states already experimenting with expanding the vote in certain ways. I think it's interesting that like almost before the constitution, you have, 
it's all, it almost seems like much more expansive. And then it starts to, at least in the Eastern side of the country, it starts to kind of close up after that. And we've got kind of this wave of openness and then restrictions around the constitution. And then the openness comes again. Um, so as we dive into that, would you, I feel like Andrew Jackson is, feels like a big turning point for voting rights and expansion past property. Yeah, so it's this key moment. It's the age of Jackson. So we would call this the 1820s, but especially into the 1830s and beyond. And there are a few really big things happening here. So first we see many, many states move towards universal white male suffrage. So with this, states are abolishing property requirements. So poor white men are now able to vote throughout the country. They weren't able to do that at the founding, but they're able to do that here as we get into the 1830s in the age of Jackson. But at the same time, we also see certain restrictions on other groups. And so this is, these are restrictions in voting of women, of African-Americans. And so by, for instance, by 1855, so on the eve of the Civil War, it's only five states concentrated in New England that are allowing free African-Americans to vote Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Um, so again, it's not zero, and that's a really important point, but it, it's, it's not exactly sweeping the nation, and it really is more of a New England story than a national story. What about women? So that's African-Americans. What do we know about women during this period? Well, in 1848, uh, abolitionists Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott organized a convention in Seneca Falls, New York. This is the famous Seneca Falls Convention. And so for the Seneca Falls Convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton drafts a famous manifesto of sorts. It's called the Declaration of Sentiments. And she literally, it's, it's such a cool document. It's pretty short. You should just go look it up and read it yourselves. But she literally looks to rewrite the Declaration of Independence. And so here's how she rewrites the famous opening words of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And so you can see here that what Stanton's doing is she's claiming many of the principles of the American Revolution and calling for equality for women. And so with this, she takes, you know, the original declaration, what is a lot of the document? It's a bunch of complaints about King George III. So here, Stanton and her allies at the Seneca Falls Convention say, no, 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 we're, we're not going to talk about a king. We're going to talk about our grievances against men and the things that they do to women and also lay out our vision for what an America where women are truly equal looks like. And so at the end of the Declaration of Sentiments, she closes with 12 demands, including equal education, equal pay, property rights, end quote, the sacred right to the elective franchise. It's even controversial at the, at the Seneca Falls Convention to include that provision. So even among these reformers, nevertheless, it's a powerful, powerful document and an early statement for what voting rights ought to look like in America. And I, so I'm so glad that this part is in this class because what we need to kind of unpack around voting rights is that idea that one of our teachers said in the chat, this idea of you are a citizen and what do you get you get protection, you get this a belief that you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And a part of how you get that is being able to pick your representative, that you have a right to have a vote. So when women are fighting for the right to vote, it is it means to an end to have voice in the government, but it is not the only thing that they're fighting for. Look at the 12 demands, look at the 12 pieces, and we're saying we need to be have equality. And so I love that you pulled that in here. And then when we think about fighting for freedom and fighting for equality around the 14th and the 15th Amendment, the next amazing woman that we always love to tell a story about is Harriet Scott um, and her amazing husband, Dred Scott. Yeah, so just uh, we could take obviously we could teach a whole class on Dred Scott, but you know, just we to do, put, coming up in a few it, weeks. <laughs> exactly. But to, to put it in the context here, uh, Harriet and Dred Scott, what they're doing, they're enslaved people who are suing for their freedom. Um, you know, they were taken into territory that was free, but they didn't allow enslaved people. And so they're arguing that that makes them free. Now, they lose this case. The Supreme Court says a couple of important things for our story and things that we revile and, 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 and you know, look upon really poorly today. So the Supreme Court says African-Americans can't be United States citizens. And they had, quote, no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. So those are the words of Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney. And part of what he's arguing, he's making an historical argument. He's saying, if you look at the sweep of American history, African-Americans, they can't be citizens. They've been treated so poorly over time. And so he makes this historical argument. At the same time, he's, he, he, he's, he, he is not 
He, he's answered by justices that are also on the court. He's answered by a pair of really powerful dissents by Justices Benjamin Curtis and Justice John McLean. And both of them effectively what they're saying is, Chief Justice Taney, what in the world are you talking about? You don't know your history. Look at the founding. It's a story we just talked about. Look at the founding. African Americans not only could be, but were citizens. African Americans not only could vote, they did vote. And so your history is just wrong. And so therefore the Dred Scott decision itself has to be wrong. And I think that's unbelievably important and the, dis the dissent, and we say this all the time, we say it so much that we made t-shirts for our teachers and our council around this. Read the dissents, because they're really going to teach us so much about what's going on in the time period. And also people's, people saying, no, this is wrong and we're gonna make change around it. So it's a great one to point out. And it moves very quickly from 1857 and those, uh, that opinion from Tani and the dissent to the 13th, just about 10 years later, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and the 15th is around the voting rights. Yeah, so these are the three amendments we ratify after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, the 13th abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment explicitly overturned Dred Scott and wrote the promises of freedom and equality into the Constitution, and the 15th Amendment banned racial discrimination in voting. Together, scholars refer to this as America's second founding. It really transformed the Constitution forever. We only have a little bit of time here, so let's actually focus on the 15th Amendment in particular and how it wound up in the Constitution and why it mattered so much during Reconstruction. So the, the 15th Amendment, it emerges initially in uh, 1868. Republicans start pushing for voting rights protections for African-Americans. And so December of 1868, Republicans are beginning to propose something that looks like the 15th Amendment. And so they're asking really big questions. They're saying, you know, we're really, we're, we want to make sure we set the right constitutional baselines. What should the baseline for voting be after we fought this civil war? And so some people say, let's focus on racial discrimination in voting. That deals with so many of the problems that are the biggest problems that led to the Civil War and that we've had since then. Let's focus, let's get that right. And let's make sure we have an amendment that bans racial discrimination in voting. But then we have other people during these debates say, no, this is an amazing moment of constitutional creation and reform. Let's go bigger. And so we have people like Representative John Bingham, one of my heroes, who, who wrote some of the most important parts of the 14th Amendment, for instance, arguing that, no, we need to protect other things like uh, you know, uh, protections based on property, based on religious creed. We need to sweep more broadly than racial discrimination. Senator uh, Henry Wilson has a draft where he says, no, no, we have to protect about uh, protect against discrimination based on education. So there's a there are big debates in the House and the Senate. Actually, the Senate and the House both pass proposals that sweep more broadly than the final amendment. Mm -hmm. But finally, Republicans have to get together. Time was running out. They get together. They say, no, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on racial discrimination and voting. That's enough of a revolution for right now. And so they settle on the text that we have in the 15th Amendment. And so while it doesn't sweep as broadly as Bingham's proposal or Wilson's proposal or even some proposals passed by Congress during the period, we have to remember this is a monumental change to the Constitution and to America, something that was absolutely inconceivable to most Americans and most political leaders prior to the Civil War. Of course, it didn't come out of nowhere, Curry. This is precisely what African-Americans, for instance, have been talking about for decades upon decades. They've been meeting in their own conventions, de debating what a vision of an equal America would look like in time and time and time again, they re return to give us the vote. We want other stuff too, don't get me wrong, but it takes a lot to have equal citizenship. But with the vote, we could really protect ourselves in so many different ways. And here you could capture, the, 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 as with a lot of things, Frederick Douglass captures the power of this moment so well. He's been fighting for voting rights for so long for African-Americans and also for women. He was, a, he was a, a part of the suffragist movement too. But after the 15th Amendment's ratified, he says, the revolution wrought in our condition by the 15th Amendment is almost startling even to me. I view it with something like amazement. And there is, there's this boom and this amazing interracial democracy. We have over 10,000 African-American people holding office during this time period. And I hate to be like the one that goes, but what happens next is the suppression of the vote. And that this does lead us to future conversations around, it's not until 1965, do we have Congress utilizing, Congress shall have more power in that, you know, truly, truly utilizing that to push back on the suppression of the vote. So can you talk a little bit about 
the 15th Amendment, this, even before the 15th Amendment, this high of amazing democracy and then the restrictions and backlash. Yeah, no, so Reconstruction is a brief moment, but what we have to remember is that for a time, far too brief a time, the vision worked. It really worked. We really did experiment in multiracial democracy. So we see during this moment, African-American voting in massive numbers, electing Republicans throughout the South and also voting to help ratify the 14th and 15th Amendment. What we have to remember is Congress passes a law during Reconstruction prior to the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendment that give African-Americans the right to vote in the South. So African-Americans are voting for these Reconstruction governments, but importantly, they're playing a central role in the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendments themselves. And so during this period into the 1870s, we see African-Americans elected to office at all levels. They're United States senators and House members. They're governors, they're state legislators, all the way down to key positions in local government like sheriff, like justices of the peace. It really was an amazing burgeoning of multiracial democracy. And it was a complete repudiation of Dred Scott and the America that came before. But as we know, it was too brief a moment. It wound up facing the challenges of, of white violence, of many of the white Southerners regaining control of their governments. And once they did, using a mix of extra legal violence, and actual laws on the books to suppress the vote and really deny the promise of the 15th Amendment. This is when we talk about Jim Crow discrimination. Jim Crow laws are various in the context of voting are various laws like poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera, that don't specifically mention race, but they keep African-Americans from the polls and deny them their constitutional right under the 15th Amendment. To 15th Amendment, 1870. And then, you know, that starts to put some of these numbers into context around the 17th, the 19th, the 23rd, the 24th. I mean, it is shocking to me that poll tax isn't banned until 1965. So almost 100 years later, that blow, I remember, I always doubt that that number and that date is right because it feels way too late. So as we kind of look through these amendments and say from 17th to 26th, how does the story kind of continue to grow? And there's also the Indian Citizenship Act, which I know that some of our students wanted to understand how Native Americans and their right to vote is intermixed with um, the 15th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and these other amendments for voting. Yeah, so I mean, each of these amendments in a certain way is providing more popular input in our elections. I think that's one way to think about it is, you know, with the 19th and the 26th, we have new protections for new groups, women with the 19th and young people with the 26th. And then we have these other ways in which we're trying to either give more popular input in elections. So with the 17th Amendment, making the direct vote for senators, we take it for granted today. That's 1913. I mean, again, it, it's a long time ago, but it actually is more recent than you might think. And then with the 23rd Amendment, making sure DC has a voice in presidential elections. And in the 24th, you're right, Curry, I think with the 24th Amendment, there were still five states that had poll taxes. And so with the 24th Amendment, we get rid of them in national elections. And then two years later in the Harper decision, the Supreme Court uses the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to say, no, 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 states can't do this either. You know, on Native Americans, that's a, it's a great question, Curry, because in the end, Native American citizenship for many Native Americans ends up turning on whether or not Congress is going to grant them citizenship rights. Um, and so we see it's not until 1924 with the Indian Citizen uh, at, at, you know, Act there where we're seeing full citizenship rights extended to Native Americans. Now, why, why the extension at that point in time? It's in part a response to Native Americans fighting in World War I. So again, we saw this with the Civil War uh, where many people are convinced that African-Americans have earned the right to participate politically precisely because they were willing to fight and die for the union cause. We see a similar thing here with the Indian Citizen Act, Citizen Act of 1924. And then also we see it with the 26th Amendment and those who go to Viet the Vietnam War um, and again are willing to sacrifice their lives for their country. The last thing to note is even with citizenship, there still are states that are denying Native Americans the right to vote. Um, and so that would be a state by state process that finally the last one of those laws that would fall, I believe was Utah's in 1957. And so it, it, you know, as we've seen again with a lot of these groups, it's, it sometimes can be a two step process of you're a citizen and then eventually we bring you into the, 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 the voice of we the people that, that have these protections for voting rights too. We saw it with African-Americans, saw it with women um, and we see it with Native Americans here. 
Awesome. And we have one minute to wrap up and there's just so many stories to tell. Um, so I think with the students, we should end on a kind of a more modern conversation, even though 1965 is not going to feel modern to anybody. Um, but I think if we end on the, what the Voting Rights Act was in 1965, we can talk about some modern conversations around voting today that they may see in the news with more modern cases as well. So give them the foundation for Voting Rights Act. Yeah, so the Voting Rights Act grows out of the long civil rights movement. In many ways, it is one of the landmark achievements of the civil rights movement. And it's Congress using the powers it was granted under the 14th and 15th Amendments to protect African-American voting rights and strike out at Jim Crow laws in the South that are keeping African-Americans from the polls. So it's really, really strong constitutional medicine. What's one of the key provisions? Well, it's, the technical word is preclearance. It's a preclearance requirement, but the idea is pretty simple. It's that if you're a state and you have a lousy record on voting rights, you have a record of discriminating against African-Americans, what we're going to say is we're going to place you under the protect, we're going to place those voters under the protection of the national government. If you state exercise your power to change your voting laws, you have to get the national government's permission before you put those new rules in place. So again, we began with the original constitution giving the state such broad power over voting and elections. With the Voting Rights Act, what we're saying here is there is this zone that dealing with race where states that have done a bad job in the past, if you want to have your traditional state powers to shape voting, you have to come to the national government first to get our permission to change your laws because we don't trust you. And so this is a huge change. There's a challenge immediately by South Carolina who's placed under this preclearance requirement. And the Supreme Court in a case called South Carolina v. Katzenbach in 1966. So again, it's only a year after this act is put in mm. place. South Carolina is saying, this goes against what we know the Constitution means. It means we states have a ton of power, especially in the context of voting. This is unconstitutional. You're not treating us like other states. You're treating us, a state, unequally. And what the Supreme Court says in an opinion by Chief Justice Earl Warren is, South Carolina, you're wrong. Things have changed. One thing we know, you have been discriminating against African Americans for decades. So we have the 15th Amendment promising to end racial discrimination in voting. You've done so many things to make sure that promise wasn't seen through in a as a practical reality for African-Americans. And furthermore, what we also know is that the 14th and 15th Amendment, they give Congress broad power to protect the protections in those amendments. The 15th Amendment's protecting African-Americans from voter discrimination. This preclearance requirement, the Voting Rights Act, this is all at the very core of Congress's power to realize that vision of racial equality and voting. So of course the Voting Rights Act is constitutional. It may be strong constitutional medicine, but it's consistent with the Constitution. And then the amazing thing, Curry, is it worked. It, it really absolutely worked. It, it struck down these, these Jim Crow laws in the South, and you see a, an explosion of political participation and voting by African Americans. But you know, over time, Congress had to look at the Voting Rights Act again. It, it, it expired after five years. There was a, a moment where they had to renew it, and Congress over time had to renew the Voting Rights Act again and again, and so they did, most recently in 2006. But we still see some challenge, you know, obviously, you know, there, there, there are ongoing debates over voting rights, but conditions change over time. And so we see a new set of challengers come out and maybe we'll end with this, a more modern case, Curry, you know, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, we see, um, we see challengers come to the Supreme Court. It's a decision in 2013 by the Roberts Court. And the challengers say, you know, that, that basically they're, they're challenging the preclearance requirement of the Voting Rights Act as it's currently carried out. And so the challengers are saying what they argue is, you know, sure, the Voting Rights Act is constitutional. South Carolina v. Katzenbach, it's right. We're not challenging that. What we're saying is that what Congress has done when it keeps reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act is it's using an old formula to determine which states need to be covered by preclearance. And so what it's saying is that Congress keeps renewing the act, but it's using old information about who's a bad actor. And so we're being held accountable for things we did decades upon decades ago, and Congress holding true to this old formula is unconstitutional. And so the Supreme Court in Shelby County v. Holder in a five to four decision says those challengers are right. So it does, the, the Supreme Court here does a couple of different things, the majority. One, they say, yes, Congress has broad power to attack racial discrimination in voting. Yes, the Voting Rights Act in so many different ways is still constitutional. But what Congress has to do if it wants to use the strong medicine of preclearance, if it wants to make certain states come to the national government to get permission before changing its laws, Congress itself has to change that old formula. It, using that old formula is unconstitutional. The dissent, which was authored by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and joined by Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor, 
echoed a lot of the arguments that Chief Justice Warren said in South Carolina v. Katzenbach. It said the 15th Amendment's text in history grants Congress a lot of power here. The court's previous decisions, like Katzenbach, have said having the Voting Rights Act in preclearance is constitutional. The Voting Rights Act has worked. It eradicated Jim Crow. It expanded African-American participation in voting, et cetera, et cetera. And Congress, furthermore, over time, if you look at how they went about renewing the Voting Rights Act, they were careful. There were extensive hearings and bipartisan majorities of Congress and presidents from both parties have reauthorized it over time, so it's constitutional. Here's the, the, the famous uh, line from Justice Ginsburg's dissent. She said, throwing out preclearance when it has worked is continuing and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes. This is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. So you see here divisions between the majority, really, I, I would say, um, uh, res responding to and, 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 and um, realizing sort of a lot of the arguments from federalism and state power that was coming from the challengers here, and Justice Ginsburg pushing back and saying, no, 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 what the court's doing here flies in the face of the 15th Amendment and South Carolina versus Katzenbach. And so, Curry, this doesn't settle anything in terms of the debates we have over time constitutionally, because so many of the most important and most contentious debates right now in our politics and at the Supreme Court often turn on questions that have to do with elections and voting. And it's precisely because all of us care so much about how elections and voting work in America. We see it here at the Supreme Court at Shelby County v. Holder, but we see it in presidential elections in Congress, in, at the Supreme Court and in the lower courts. It's everywhere. And thank you so much. And this is, I think, when we talk about um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, people recognize really quickly that it, it feels like in, in more con current memory. And it is because of these cases looking back at it. And it is, it is a debate that we're having in our country. How do we put the voting rights into the Constitution? How does it play out among the states? And it's a part of every discussion going on. So this is why I absolutely love this class. And Tom, thank you so much for giving us that really strong structure. So when we hear the national debates or the local debates, we can look back to the Constitution and say, what does the Constitution say about this? And where are the acts that are connected to the acts of Congress and the work of Congress around these voting rights? So thank you so much for that. Students, great questions in class. Thank you so much for staying along. And there is one follow-up question. I'm just gonna stop recording and then we will ask Tom.